Hey guys, this is Homework with Miss Ray, and we are reading our final homework assignment. People should not die in June in South Texas. Guys, I'm excited about this passage, even though it's very sad. Um, I feel like it expresses moments that we have in common. I love the language. So not only is there English in this text, but there is Spanish. And so I really want you to use your inferencing skills. I thought about translating for you guys, but I am not going to do that. I am going to figure it out and make my own connections with you because sometimes we may not always have the opportunity to be like, hey, what does this mean? Allow yourself to dive in and just figure out through inferencing what's happening. If you already know Spanish, then you are two steps ahead of me. I'm still learning. So let's just see how this goes. So we're doing visual annotations. And again, we are gathering evidence. So let's see where we're at. Let's just first go ahead and number our paragraphs. One, two, three and this chunk here is a part of three so this is four five i'm going to start six on the next page six seven eight nine ten eleven 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, I'm gonna start 22 over here, 23, 24, 25, 26. This is still a part of 26 here at the top, so 27, 28, 29, 30 and 31. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and dive right in. Make this a little big over here if I can. All right. So we're reading people should not die in June in South Texas. Pretita squeezes through the crowd of mourners and finds a place near the coffin. She stands there for hours, watching relatives and friends, one after the other, approach the coffin, kneel beside it. They make the sign of the cross, bow slowly while backing away. Even a few Anglos come to pay their respects, while Urbano, loved by all. But after two and a half days, her father has begun to smell like a cow whose carcass has been gutted by vultures. People should not die in June in South Texas. So we have a lot going on here. There's imagery. There's thoughts. There's actions. Can you tell where we are? Well, let's see here. I have a coffin. I have mourners. Mourners are people who are crying or regretful or sad from someone's death. I have, let's see here. I have people coming to pay their respects. And she said here that her father smells like a cow whose carcass has been gutted by vultures. So I can tell that I'm at a funeral. I can tell that her father is the one who has died. So if he's starting to smell, maybe they didn't embalm him correctly. Why does her father stink? Normally dead bodies aren't supposed to stink. So this is something that I'm just thinking about. I've been to funerals before and I have never smelled the carcass. So I'm wondering why her father stinks. Could it be because it's the heat? 
It says here, people shouldn't die in June in South Texas. We live in Texas and we know it is super hot. So the month of June and it being the South of Texas, does that matter? Pay attention to how the author is describing this moment. We're at a funeral. The character is a girl and her father is dead. Earlier that day, Pratita and her mother had gone to the funeral. Here we go. To the funeral home where in some hidden room, someone was making two inch incision in her father's throat. Someone was inserting a tube in his jugular vein. In some hidden room, una envenada abuja filled his venas with embalming fluid. I apologize in advance, my Spanish is awful. So again, I apologize in advance. So we have actions and we have imagery. I can picture her going into the funeral home. I can picture her looking at the rooms. If you've ever been in a funeral home before, it almost looks like a church just with more rooms. And so there's someone there um, a mortician who takes the dead bodies. If you've ever watched SVU or any of those crime shows, they cut a slit in the throat in order to put embalming fluid in. This pushes out all of the fluid that's already in your body, like blood and tissue, and it starts to fill it with fluid so your body stays like you're still alive. So you don't start to uh, defecate and get real smelly and nasty. So this embalming fluid keeps your body looking like it's still alive. The white undertaker put his palm on the small of her mother's back and propelled her toward the more expensive coffins. Her mother couldn't stop crying. She held a handkerchief to her eyes like a blindfold, nodding and unraveling it, nodding and unraveling it. Prita, forced to be the more practical of the two, said, let's take that one or this one, pointing at the coffins mid-range in price. Though they would be in debt for three years, they chose un cachon de Quintino's, Quintino's dollars, $500. They chose the one for $500. The caretaker had shown them the backless suits. So let me pause here. So I have dialogue. I have emotion. And I have imagery. Okay, so they're at the funeral home and they have to pay for a coffin. The mother is so sad that she's lost her husband. She's not thinking straight. And it looks like this guy here is trying to get her to buy the more expensive coffin because she's not thinking straight. So her daughter is going to take responsibility and be like, no, we're going to get that cheaper one. Okay. So she tells us how much it costs and now they're moving onward. All right, so the undertaker had shown them the backless suits whose prices range from 70 to several hundred dollars. Compraron un traje negro y una camisa blanca con enaje color de rosa. They bought a black suit and a white shirt with pink. Why are we buying such an expensive suit? It doesn't even have a bag. And besides, it's going to rot soon she told her mother softly. Her mother looked at her and burst out crying again. Her mother was either hysterical or very quiet and withdrawn. So Preeta had to swallow her own tears. They had returned in the, in the hearse with the coffin to a house filled with relatives and friends with tables laden with comida and buckets overflowing with ice and curvesa, which is beer. So, we have emotions here again. We also have imagery. We also have actions. So they're buying clothes for, the, for her father. Her mother is still emotional, she's sad. And we also get her thoughts. 
um, to where she has to hold back her own tears and her own emotions. So there's a lot going on where she has to be strong for her mother right now. Preeta stands against the living room wall, watching the hundreds of people slowly milling around. Tia Campo, Tia Campano in El Pasar, dice la tia as she embraces her. The stench of alcohol enters her nostrils when male relatives pay their condolences to her. Preeta se siente jalada y asfixiada al mismo tiempo. She feels cold, shocked and suffocated. Qui guapa es la mayor y si parece mucho a su mamá. She hears a woman say, bursting into tears and clutching Pritita in a desperate embrace. Faint whiffs of perfume escape from the woman's hair behind their thick black mantillas. The smells of roses and carnations, carne guisada, Sweat and body heat mingle with the sweet smell of death and fill the house in Hargill. So we have imagery again. She's describing the people who are there. They're telling her that she's beautiful, that she's older, that she looks like her mother. But what sticks out to me the most is that she's cold, shocked, and suffocated. What does it mean if she's cold? Maybe she doesn't feel anything. Maybe the fact that her father has died is a surprise and she feels suffocated because there's so many people around that she really can't even process how she feels. Antes del quejón en medio de la sala, alulando a la virgen si mama grande, locha cade rodillas presenados. But Preeta does not cry. She is the only one at the Valario who is dry eyed. Why can't she cry? Does that sound familiar? Hmm. Why can't she cry? Didn't we have another character who couldn't cry? Bud. We have something similar. Bud could not cry. And why couldn't he cry? Well, Bud couldn't cry because he had been through so much pain already. Is that the same for Preeta? La Dan ganas no de lolar, pero de riar a carajadas. I am killing this Spanish. I know it. I'm going to hear it from you guys tomorrow. Instead of crying, she feels like laughing. It isn't natural. I'm going to underline that. Instead of crying, she feels like laughing. It isn't natural. She felt the tightness in her throat give way. Her body trembled with fury. How dare he die? Okay. How dare he abandon her? How could he leave her mother all alone? Her mother was just 28. It wasn't fair. Sale de la casa corriendo. She runs out of the house. Atraveso la calle. She crosses the street. Tro tropezandos en las piedras while stumbling over rocks. Lego a la casa de Mama Grande Romana. En donde estaba su hermanito, Carito, el más chiquito. She reached her grandmother's house where her little brother was hiding out. His bewildered face asked questions she could not answer. So we have thoughts and her thoughts seem to be all over the place. First, she's, she can't cry. Now she thinks it's funny, but then she's upset and she has all of these questions. So there's thoughts, there's emotions, and there's actions. So she leaves the funeral home and she goes to her grandmother's house and she has a brother and he's also confused. If he's younger than her, he doesn't understand either. And so she can't really explain all the things that are happening. Later, Pratita slips back into the house and returns to her place.
returns back to her place by the coffin. Standing on her toes, she cocks her head over to the casket. What if that sweet putrid smell, putrid means nasty. Remember in the first paragraph, she talked about how the carcass stinks. So that sweet putrid smell is perfume injected into his veins to fool them all into thinking he is dead. What if it's all a conspiracy, a lie? Under the, under the overturned red truck, someone else's face had lain broken, smashed beyond recognition. The blood on the highway had not been her father's blood. Okay, so here we go. They're telling us how he died. So we're getting some information. So right here, under the overturned red truck, someone else's face had laid broken. So her dad might have gotten in a car accident or he might have been hit by a car. Smashed beyond recognition. The blood on the highway had not been her father's blood. So he might have been hit by a car um if he if they can't recognize his face so we got information and we also have her thoughts and i'm going to add imagery in there because i can picture a smashed face on the road okay next paragraph for three days her father sleeps in his coffin her mother sits at his side every night and never sleeps. Oliendo a mirte, Pretita duerme en su cama. Prita sleeps in her bed with the smell of death. En sus sueños, in her dreams. Su, prad, su padre abrí los ojos al mirarla. Her father opens his eyes. Abre su boca a contestarle. He opens his mouth to answer her. See la ventana del cajón. He rises out of the coffin. On the third day, Prita rises from her bed, vacant eye, puts on her black blouse and skirt and black scarf and walks to the living room. She stands before the coffin and waits for the hearse. In the car behind the hearse on the way to the church, Pritita sits quietly beside her mother, sister, and brothers. Stiff legs, she gets out of the car and walks to the hearse. She watches the pallbearers, Tio David, Rafael, Goyo, El Compadre, Juan, and others lift the coffin out of the hearse, carry it inside the church, and set it down in the middle of the aisle. Okay, we definitely have emotions. We definitely have, uh oh, sorry guys, we definitely have imagery. And we have actions. Okay. So she's really diving us in. And I love how even though they're Spanish, the author gives us English as well. And I think reading the Spanish, even though I'm doing a horrible job, it really helps me understand the emotion and how she feels. So she talks about imagining that her father wakes up. Now, they use three days, and I think this is similar to Jesus because in three days he rose. And so maybe she's imagining, well, maybe in three days my father will open his eyes. Maybe he'll wake up. Maybe he'll tell me what happened because I feel like there's still some um, gray areas that she, that she wants to know. All right, going on to paragraph eight. El cuerpo de su padre está tindido. In medio de la iglesia, her father's corpse lies in the middle of the church. She watches one woman after another kneel before La Virgen de Guadalupe and light a candle. Soon hundreds of votive candles flicker their small flames and emit the smell of burning tallow. Burning tallow. I'm thinking tallow because I don't know. I'm not a human dictionary. Burning tallow, I believe. If they're going to emit, emit means to get rid of. I think it's getting away, getting rid of the smell of the dead body. So we have imagery. I can picture those candles. I can see people in the church. And we have action. Okay. It 
misericordia e jus a progenes timitibus ium. In tones, the priest, flanked by altar boys on both sides, his purple gown rustles as he swings his censers over her father's body and face. Clouds of frankincense cover the length of the dark shimmy, shimmy coffin. Okay. So we have imagery again, and she's just describing the scene of what's going on. At last, the pallbearers return to the coffin, sporting mustaches and wearing black ties. Con bigote y corbata negra, they stand stiffly in their somber suits. She had never seen these ranchers, farmers, and farm workers in suits before. In unison, they take a deep breath. With a quick movement, they lift the coffin. Her mother holds Carito's hands and follows the coffin while Prita, her sister and brother, walk behind them. So we have imagery again. And we also have action. Okay, so now I think the funeral is over. The pastor has, or the priest has spoken. They're taking the coffin and I think they're preparing to go ahead and bury um, her father. So they're now leaving. All right. Outside near the cars parked in the street, Prita watches the church slowly emptying, watches the church becoming a hollowed out thing. People are leaving in their black cotton and rayon dresses, following the coffin with face, faces under five woven mantillas. The women all look like Yuracas Pritas, like black crows. Her own nickname was Yuraca Prita, black crows. You normally see crows. Um, are, crows are a symbol of death, and they're, they're just not a great bird. <laughs> they're not a great bird. Um, so you have imagery, and I'm going to say these are her thoughts, what she thinks about herself. So guys, I'm going to leave my screen on the side where the pictures are. Since you have the text, I think it'll be easier. All right. From her uncle's car en route to the cemetery, Prita watches the billows of dust rise in the wake of the hearse. Her skin feels prickly with sweat and something else. As the landscape recedes, recedes means it goes away. Um, you may even see, let's say a man has a receding hairline, which means he's going bald. That means the hair is going away. So the landscape recedes, which means she can't see it anymore. Pratita feels as though she is traveling backwards to yesterday, to the day before yesterday, to the day she last saw her father. Prita imagines her father as he drives the red truck filled to the brim with cotton bales. One hand suddenly leaves the wheel to clutch his chest. His body arches, then his head and chest slump over the wheel, blood streaming out through his nose and mouth. His foot lies heavy on the gas pedal. The red 10-ton truck keeps going until it gets to the second curve on the East Highway going toward Edinburgh. Wake up, Poppy. Turn the wheel. But the truck keeps on going off the highway. It turns over. The truck turns over and over. The doors flapping open, then closing, and the truck keeps turning over and over until Prita comes, makes it stop. Her father is thrown out. The edge of the back of the truck crashes his face crushes his face. Six pairs of wheels spin in the air. White cotton bales are littered around him. The article in the newspaper said that according to the autopsy report, his aorta had burst. The largest artery in the heart ruptured. Okay, there is a lot to unfold in this. So we got a lot of information. So in this paragraph, we learned how her father died. So not only was it a car crash, he had um, his heart basically uh, ruptured. So um, an artery in his heart busted, basically. And that's where the blood comes from. So he's driving. It's almost like a heart attack. So he's driving and he clutches his chest. And his heart is hurting so much so 
that it ruptures and blood comes out. So now if you can imagine, he's not paying attention to the road because he's in pain. He, his foot presses on the gas and there's a truck coming. The truck on the other side turns over and crashes. It hits his car. Her father flies out of his truck and crushes into the, the truck. So this is really gruesome. And if you can, I would love it if you would reread this paragraph because it's so thick with details. And so how he died, his heart ruptured and he um, flies out of his car, flies out the truck. and he gets crushed so it's almost like he died twice um and so the author gives us imagery and so she keeps she says that she goes back to yesterday and the day before that she's picturing and she's imagining his death and so i i'm just like wow wow okay so let's keep going she had not seen the crows, las uracas pritas, gather on the Ibano in the backyard the night before that bright day in June. If they had not announced his death, then he couldn't be dead. It was a conspiracy, a lie. So she's thinking that, and these are her thoughts, that maybe it'd be easier if she didn't know. The thought that maybe if no one had told me that he was dead, I could know that he was still alive somewhere. And so that's what she's thinking. So down here, I'm going to read the English version because I just feel like I'm tearing the Spanish apart. Is it over? What's happening? Reflect on his figure. Death has, oh, don't do that to me. Okay. Sorry, guys. Woo. All right. Death has covered him with pale sulfurs and has given me given him a dark monitor head. So a monitor is like a bull. Um, and so basically he has a bull's head on top of him. I don't necessarily know what this means. And sometimes this happens. Um, I don't know everything. So is it over? What's happening? Reflect on his figure. So she's thinking about I should focus on focus on my father picture him remember him like he was death has covered him with pale sulfurs so death has covered him sulfur is like um the soot so if you go to a barbecue and when the barbecue is over you look in the grill and there's all of this gray thin powder that's sulfur so he's covered in that and he has a head of a monitor. I don't know what it means for him to have a head of a monitor. I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. And it's kind of creepy. So, <laughs> so yeah, let's talk about that tomorrow for sure. Because I don't think that's a positive thing, um, having a head of a monitor. All right, let's keep going. All righty. All right. The padrinas placed the coffin under the ebony tree. People pile flower wreaths at her father's feet. Gretita shuffles over to her father lying in the coffin. Her eyes trace the jagged lines running through his forehead, cheek and chin, where the undertaker had sewn the skin together. The broken nose, the chalky skin with the tinge of green underneath is not her father's face. No es la cara de su papi. No. That bright day, June 22nd, someone else had been driving his truck. Someone else had been wearing his khaki pants, his gold wire-rimmed glasses. Someone else had his gold front tooth. So right here I have imagery. I have her thoughts. And the fact that she's still in denial, that she really can't believe that this was him. 
and the fact that she's describing what he looks like. So her eyes trace the jagged lines running through his forehead. Because remember, she said that his face was like smashed and crushed, cheek and chin, where the undertaker sewn the skin together, his broken nose, his chalky skin. I mean, he probably doesn't even look the same anymore, guys. Okay. Mr. Led, uh, Ledner, her history teacher, had said that the Nazis jerked the gold teeth out of the corpses of the Jews and melted them into rings and made their skin into lampshades. She did not want anyone to take her poppy's gold tooth. Prita steps back from the coffin. So this, I'm going to say this is information. She's telling us something that she's learned. So she's actually making a connection like us teachers tell you guys to do. She's making a connection to something she may have read or learned in class and applying it to a moment right now. The blood in the highway could not be her father's blood. I don't want to see it. Tell the moon to come that I don't want to see the blood. So when it's dark, you probably can't see blood or it just looks like it's glistening. So maybe with night coming, it's supposed to cover everything up and make everything go away. Um, so I'm just going to say that this is an emotion. If you feel like it's something else, you are free to change it. But I'm going to put emotion there. As she watches her father, a scream forms in her head. No, no, no. She thinks she almost sees death creep into her father's unconscious body, kick out his soul and make his body stiff and steel. She sees La Muerte's long pale fingers take possession of her father, sees death place its hands over what had been her father's heart. A fly buzzes by, brings her back to the present. She sees a fly crawl over one of her father's hands, then land on his cheek. She wants him to raise his hand and fan the fly away. He lies unmoving. She raises her hand to crush the fly, then lets it fall back to the side. Swatting the fly would mean hitting her poppy. Death, too, lets the fly crawl over itself. Maybe the fly and death are friends. Maybe death is unaware, so inconsequently, so inconsequential a thing as an insect. She is like the fly trying to ruse her father. Es esa mosca. So the fact that she's watching her father, this is all imagery. And I love, I love, love, love this story, even though it's sad. But I just love how it's describing everything. So she, and we all know the Grim Reaper, La Muertes, um, the Grim Reaper is there and it's taking his place. Um, so even if you ever seen um, Coco, the movie Coco, where the where the dead leave their bodies and they go somewhere else. This is similar to what she's describing, but instead it's a little darker. So instead of her father going off to a far off place and waving goodbye, his soul is being snatched away and a, a creepier uh death basically death is taking his place and so he can't even remove a fly and it's so oh i just love the way this is written and so she's really dealing with the fact that her father's gone so we get imagery we get thoughts and we even get action okay she stands looking by the coffin at her own small hands, fleshly, ruddy hands, and forces herself to clench her fist. A beat pulses in her thumb. When her hands are no longer ruddy nor pulsating, she will lie like him. She will lie utterly still. Maggots will find her hands, will seek out her heart. Worms will crawl in and out of her vagina, and the world will continue as usual. That is what shocks her the most about her father's death, that people still laugh, the wind continues to blow, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Life will go on. So she's reflecting. We have imagery again. 
She's thinking, this is going to happen to me one day. And everyone after the funeral is going to go about their lives as usual. This is similar to one of the fears in Fallen Angels, where he looks at the dead bodies and almost feels like he is one day or one step away from dying and being thrown in that pile of bodies with everyone else. This is very similar to fallen angels. Okay. Prita walks away from the coffin and stands at the edge of the gaping hole under the ebony tree. The hole is so deep, el pozo tan hondo, the earth so black, la tierra tan prita, she takes great gulps of air, but can't get enough into her lungs. Nausea winds its way, winds its way up from the pit of her stomach, fills her chest and becomes a knot when it reaches her throat. Oh, this sounds familiar. Her body sways slowly back and forth. Someone gently tugs her away. Los hombres push a metal apparatus over the hole and los padrinos place the coffin over it. This is very similar to paragraph 17 in Bud, not Buddy. I'm going to put a star here. Remember when Bud talks about... Remember when Bud talks about that feeling where he gets choked up and he's fighting back tears? This is the same description described. So this is something that happens to anybody. It's not just related to just Bud. So we have uh, descriptions, imagery... And we have thoughts again. Um, so these are, and I'm going to add emotion. I got a lot going on here. Because she's feeling a lot of different emotions. And I think finally now that they're about to put him in the ground, we might get to see those tears. What's going to happen after he's buried in the ground? Under the Ibano, around the hole, a procession forms. A procession is the people that came to see. The small country cemetery with Mexicans buried on one side and a few Anglos on the other is now bulging with hundreds of cars, imales de gente, imales de flores. So this is just information telling us who's there um, and also her describing what it looks like. Perita hears the weir of the machine and looks back to see it lowering her father into the hole. Someone tosses in a handful of dirt. Then the next person does the same. And soon a line of people forms waiting their turn. Perita listens to the thuds, the slow shuffle of feet as the line winds and unwinds like a giant serpent. Her turn comes. She bends to pick up a handful of dirt. She loosens her clenched fist over the hole and hears the thud of terremotes hit her father's coffin. Drops fall onto the dust-covered coffin. They make little craters on the cajon's smooth surface. She feels as though she is standing alone near the mouth of an abyss. An abyss is like an empty, very deep, deep, deep hole. Near the mouth, slowly swallowing her father. An unknown sweetness and familiar anguish beckon her. Beckon means to call. As she rocks back and forth near the edge, she listens to Mama Grande's litani. Mi hijo, mi hijo tan bueno, Diosito mío, ¿por qué si lo llevo? Ay, mi hijo. So we have dialogue here. Oh, my thing came out a little, looks like a shark, sorry. Um, we have imagery. There's nothing but imagery in this text. It's a ton. Uh, we have emotions. And we have actions because she's throwing the dirt on her father's funeral, um, on his coffin. And this is really solidifying. He is gone. The dirt is there. It's, it's That's it. Next Sunday, the whole family has to go to Mass. Mass is almost like the Catholic version of church. So it's like they're going to church. But Prita doesn't want to attend. Heavily veiled women dressed in black kneel on the cement floor of the small church and recite the rosary. So we have imagery. We have actions. Her not wanting to go is a choice. Um, and we have, what was I thinking? 
imagery, actions, and emotions because she doesn't want to go. Why? Because she feels sad. She just lost her dad. Why do I want to go? Okay, next page. We're almost done. In sing-song monotones, Lorosas Rezaban El Rosario, hands moving slowly over the beads. Santa Maria, Madre de Dios, Rurga por nosotros. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us now and at the hour of our death. Her mother and Mama Grande Loca, Loja, dedicate Sunday Masses to her father, promising La Virgin, La Virgina, Mass a week for the coming year. They pay a small fee for each, all for a man who had never entered church except for the funeral mass of a friend or a relative. So, uh oh, sorry. So we have information. Her father never went to church. Um, and we also have imagery. Her mother was Luto bowing before a statue of La Virgin de Guadalupe to wear black for two years and gray for two more. In September, when school resumes, her mother tells Prita and her sister that they are to wear black for a year, then gray or brown for another two. At first, her classmates stare at her. Prita sees the curiosity and fascination in their eyes, slowly turn to pity and disdain. But soon they get used to seeing her in black and drab colored clothes, and she feels invisible once more and invincible. Ah. So, of course, we have imagery. Her mother is going to take a vow to wear black and then for two years, and then two years again to do gray, and she's going to make the daughters do that. Um, so this is something maybe she's doing to show respect, maybe to show you know that she's still mourning um, the death of her husband and making the girls do it too. I wonder... If in this last paragraph, I'm going to put information because maybe like Star Girl, she's not popular either. So, and it says she feels invisible, want, invisible once more. So maybe they're talking about she feels invisible at school again, or was she invisible at the funeral? In which way do you think that she felt invisible? After school and on weekends, her mother shushes them when they speak loudly or laugh, forbids them to listen to the radio, and coyers at the TV with a blanket. Preetha remembers when her father bought the TV. The other kids had been envious, that's jealous, because hers had been the first Mexican family to have an extravagant luxury. Her father had bought it for them, saying it would help his hijitos learn to speak English without an accent. If they knew English, they could get good jobs and not have to work themselves to death. So we're getting information. So her father worked hard for them and he was involved. Maybe he didn't go to church, but he was a family man and he cared about his kids and he worked hard. So we have information and we have imagery. Pasa mucho tiempo. Days and weeks and years pass. Prita espera a muerto. She waits for the dead. Every evening, she waits for her father to walk into the house, tired after a day of hard work in the fields. She waits for him to wrap his knuckles on the top of her head, the one gesture of intimacy he allowed himself with her. She waits for him to gaze at her with his green eyes. She waits for him to take off his shirt and sit bare-chested on the floor, back against the sofa watching TV, the black curly hair on the back of his head showing. Now she thinks she hears his footsteps on the front porch and turns eagerly toward the door. For years, she waits. For years, she waits for him to thrust open the sagging door to return from the land of the dead. For her father is a great and good man, and she is sure God will realize he has made a mistake and bring him back to them. Ooh, guys, I'm getting a little choked up. So we have imagery. It's been some years now and she's still waiting for him to show up. Um, we get information about what he used to do when he would come home. We get emotions. Her and her father were uh, pretty much close, 
and um, she just misses his presence. And so sometimes because you get used to certain things and if people have a routine, you expect things so she can still hear his footprints, like his footsteps, like he's coming home. She's still expecting these normal behaviors, even though her father is gone. To, um, in El Dia de los Muertos, on the day of the dead, El Primero de Noviembre, on the 1st of November, ella lo espera, she waits for him. Aunque no más viniera a vistalaros, vistalaros, uh, even if he only came to visit. Aunque no si cuadera, even if he didn't stay, she wants to see him, quiere verlo. But one day, four years after his death, she knows that neither the one God nor her father will ever walk through the door again. Oh, this is so sad. So here are, this is imagery. We have emotions. Um, and again, this goes back to Coco. If you've ever seen it before, um, it's something that's really popular in Mexican culture. Ooh, hit my head. Uh, Day of the Dead, uh, where they celebrate their 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 deceased family members who pass. Um, this is something that is really important in their culture. And even though it's something that is done, where she may expect for him to show up, he's not. And she really has to deal with the fact that he's gone. And lastly, but no one will want to look at your eyes because you have died forever, like all the dead on earth. And I'm just gonna put an emotion on this one because this is really sad. There's no happy ending. There's no um, cheer up. This is, you know, it's it ends sad. There's no happy ending in this story. Um, oh, this is so good. So we were able to make connections. We were able to make connections to But Not Buddy. We were able to make connections to Fallen Angels really more so looking at how does this pain, how is this pain going to change her perspective on life? Will she grow from it? Will she be um, scarred like Bud? Or is she always going to remember that time when she put the sand in the hole like, um, like the guy in Fallen Angels will always remember the smell of burning flesh? There's so many connections, guys, and we're going to do so much with these three texts um, in the upcoming weeks. I'm so excited. All right. So here we go. I'm going to have you guys do these five. We have information. Um, we have dialogue. We have emotion, imagery, actions, and thoughts. So I'm going to assist you with finding and what paragraphs you can pull from, but I am not going to do this for you, OK? Not going to do it for you. I know I had some second people, second period kids ask me, but I really want to challenge you guys to stretch your thought process on this. OK, so let's find some good thoughts. What paragraphs can I get some good thoughts from? Hmm, hmm, hmm. Let's do for thoughts. Let's do paragraph five for thoughts. Uh, paragraph five, just to go back, she's thinking about, you know, how could her father leave? She's thinking about, you know, the why can't she cry? Instead of crying, she feels like laughing. What are all these thoughts telling me? For actions. I'm trying to follow the feet, follow the feet. And for thoughts, if you want, you can use um, 13 as well. That's a good one. Uh, let me see, actions. Okay, so for actions, ah, what do I want to use? Okay, 
So for actions, I'm going to do paragraph three. So that's when she has to help her, her mother choose the casket because her mother is crying. What do those actions show us? Guys, there's so much imagery like... Oh my gosh. And I think I know which imagery I I like. I'm just trying to find it because this was such a long passage. Okay. So for imagery, I'm going to use paragraph 16. And you could also reference paragraph 6 as well. Those two go together. For emotion, there's a ton of emotion in here. We'll do paragraph 25 for emotion. For dialogue, It's not a lot of dialogue. All right. I don't have a lot of dialogue. So what I'm going to do, let's cancel that out. No dialogue. Yay. Information. Information, you can use paragraph 28. Ooh, and paragraph 24. Choose between one of those two. Now, do you have to use the paragraphs that I've suggested? Nope, you can use what you want. I'm just giving you these as something to work with. I want you guys to go back through and put it in perspective. And I want clear, beautiful, written paragraphs. And actually, I have a student who always gives me five-star assignments for their homework, if I can find it really fast, because this video is already super duper long. So I have two students, and I want to show you what your homework should look like. And it always looks so good and well thought out. So I have one student, her name is Rosie, and this is what her homework looks like. She has clear sentences, very well written. She has her paragraphs, and you can tell she develops her thoughts, and she's going over, she's going over the lines, guys, because she wants to show me that she understands what's happening in the text. So. She is giving me full, complete sentences. She's referencing what's happening in the text, and it's very well thought out. Another great student of mine is Ian. He really takes the time to show me what he knows and what he understands. He's also going over the lines because he's not trying to be quick. He's not trying to throw something together, but he really takes the time to look at characters' names and information from the text to show me he understood the story. He also has his paragraphs. So you can tell he's taking his time to really understand what the whole story was about. This is 100% work okay so this is what i'm looking for tomorrow take your time do it right hope you guys have a good time doing this i know i say that loosely i'll see you guys tomorrow